course, the staggering thing about old John's work, you know, for someone who's in the same trade, is how, you know, one actor, who knows pretty well how the tricks are worked and how the, the thing is done, can get completely deceived by a fellow whom you do a show with almost every day of your life. I was so jealous of John because he was such a wonderful actor. He brings always from life these realizations and not from other parts of the theater. Telescope 67. Tonight brought to you by your telephone company, part of the Trans-Canada Telephone System. A great many people thought John Draney was the greatest radio actor in the English-speaking world. John thought of himself as the guardian of the spoken word. He was always concerned with the sense of what he was saying as an actor, concerned with achieving a sense of truth. He was a member of the aristocracy of those who care. Tonight's posthumous tribute to a cherished Canadian artist was conceived as a living portrait. We started filming it with its subject participating actively in the story of a life that began in British Columbia on an April day in 1916. Not many years after that, John and I became friends, playing games when we were kids in the back lanes of Vancouver, then in radio, the theater, television, films, life itself going on. Radio, of course, brought us the real flowering of John Draney's talent. But the voice that created Jake, recreated Stephen Leacock, and gave us scores of unforgettable performances was silenced on an October day in 1966 when John Draney died of cancer in his Toronto home. The present tense became abruptly the past tense. Tonight, with the collaboration of many distinguished colleagues and friends, director Lister Sinclair has blended the present and the past into a tribute to a great Canadian actor of many achievements, not the least of which was a sense of truth. A memory of John Draney, one minute from now. An actor's life is a marvelous life. <laughs> I think it's a good job. A nice job. And besides, it doesn't take any brains. None. <laughs> I'm afraid, though, that you have to have talent. If you haven't got it, I don't know what you do. I don't know how it can be shoved into you or riveted in or spliced in or something. I, I just don't know. I think it's impossible. You've got to have it. Look, it seems to be done in a instinctive and, you would think, careless way. But uh, like most good careless things, it's rapturous because of a great deal of uh, very hard, drudging work. I love the sound of words. I love speaking words. And this man, I suppose, fulfills this more than anyone else. Well, you know, and don't you ken it, and haven't I told you every tellin' as a tailin', and that's the he and the she of it. Look, look, the dusk is growing. My branches lofty are taking root, and my cold cheer's gone ashly. Filou, filou, what age is that? It's on is late. I'm doing it in an Irish accent. Now, I'm not, I'm, I don't know why I'm doing I heard uh, James Joyce himself do it. And he, of course, he has a beautiful Irish accent. But it's, it's all part of the game. It, it sounds right. You couldn't do it in any other accent. I don't quite know what he's talking about. But you're on a, a curious rocket of meaning, which takes you in. 500 different directions at once. And you also have all the poetic values coming at you like a, like a bombardment. There's one line that I always remember of his because it illustrates how he is to me. It's a line in Heart of Darkness, that adaptation from Joseph Conrad. 
where he played a cameo of a little man on a beach who had known this terrible man everybody is seeking called Kurtz. And he describes Kurtz and says he's a very terrible man. He talked all night and he frightened me. Oh, but he enlarged my mind. Draney always enlarges mine. Andrew Allen was doing a production of Alice in Wonderland and Alice through the looking glass and John was playing the White Knight. Well, I was chatting to him before his entrance in a rehearsal about something that had nothing to do with the play. It was something funny and I, I remember he smothered a laugh with his hand and suddenly realized he had about 10 seconds to get to the microphone before his first line. Well, somehow during the 10 steps it took him to get to the microphone, he turned from John Draney into the White Knight, as I had always imagined him. I see you're admiring my little box, the White Knight said in a friendly tone. It's my own invention to keep clothes and uh, sandwiches in. He seems to be making up these inventions as he goes along. You know, he's not alone, this old fella. He's part of a lineage, a lineage of, of grace and chivalry and of the, the finer things of the human spirit. Uh, and um, a number of writers have created this character. And uh, so you see him um, sort of reoccurring again and again in, in literature. Um, Sir Andrew A. Uchik is very typical Shakespeare in uh, Twelfth Night. He sets himself against Malvolio, the Puritan, because he wants, he wants to have the good life. He wants to be able to sit around with his friend and drink wine and have a little song. And, uh, you know, what's life for? And uh, Cervantes came along and then uh, created another character, Don Quixote. And again, here was the master creation. The knight who was very old and probably senile, who went out to fight against something. And you wonder why he's fighting against windmills. But it's curious, the windmill had just been invented. So really it was just, as, it was a newfangled creation of that time. It's like uh, somebody going out with a pop gun and, and uh, taking pot shots at the president of uh, IBM when he comes out of his office. <laughs> uh, but uh, this same marvelous quality is all the way through the the old knights, and here he is in the Lewis Carroll version. Uh, <coughs> um, clothes and sandwiches in. You see, I carry it upside down. He's got to explain it. Uh, so that the rain can't get in. But the things can get out, Alice gently remarked. Do you know the lid's open? Oh, oh, I didn't know it, the knight said, a shade of vexation passing over his face. Then all the things must have fallen out, and the box is no use without them. He unfastened it as he spoke and was just going to throw it in the bushes when a sudden thought seemed to strike him, and he hung it carefully on a tree. Can you guess why I did that? He said to Alice. Alice shook her head. In hopes some bee may make a nest in it. Then I should get the honey. Like most artists, John dreamt of visiting Europe. He was able to tape his story readings so in the autumn of 1960, his dream became a reality. He and I and our six children were no sooner settled in Spain when John announced that he was going to realize another dream. 
He was going to make a film. Well, he turned out to mean we, the whole family. David and Philip were the stars of the film. Darling, I got those lines you wanted. Mm -hmm. Those lines you asked me to write. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, for the flower. Yeah. Yeah, read it. Go ahead. Okay. He said, he's tying yeah. it up, and he said, yeah. when flowers die, people throw them away. Mm -hmm. And so up you come, roses and tulips, and this is a nice tulip. This is geranium. When flowers die, people throw them away. So up you come, roses and tulips, and this is a nice tulip. Uh, then he said, why do flowers die? Why does God make flowers die? Very good. That's all his time for. Very good. Yeah. And the music just fades out. Yeah. Marv, okay, that's I'll great. Some more of that. Yeah, I have to finish okay. off this short story, uh, and then we'll do it. And at the same time, I'd like to do the lines of Davy at the pool with the rocks. He oh, drops yeah. two rocks. I can splash this stone. There now, it's all wet. Now it can't get out. 